What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. For those of you that are new to my channel, feel free to watch some of my other videos where I review my 7 figure dividend portfolio that I've built up over 25 years of investing in the markets. I'd like to thank everyone for their kind comments they have left on my last video, which was about the time I sold my entire dividend and growth portfolios, only to rebuy my positions months later. As you saw, it was real and not clickbaity and was the most profound experience I ever had, coupled with one of the most emotional. It annoys me when I click on a video hoping that it's about what the title implies, only to find out it isn't. In this video I'm going to analyze a subscriber portfolio that was sent to me who asked me for my feedback. Then I'm going to follow Tinder's lead and swipe right if I like it, or left if I dislike it. After that I'm going to tell you about the first company in history to ever pay a dividend, and then I'll tell you about a stock that very few people talk about that has blown the S&P 500 out of the water for the last 20 years, and has been paying dividends for over 200 consecutive years, which is the most in the world and has been consecutively raising their dividends for 23 years. Okay, start your engines. If you can hit that like button, I'd appreciate it, as it helps push my videos out to other people on YouTube. And as a quick caveat, I'm not a licensed professional wealth manager, so as always, don't take anything I say as financial advice you should follow. Additionally, I'll run a poll in the community tab on my YouTube channel so that you can vote on if you like or dislike this portfolio. That way we can see how the whole community feels about the portfolio, rather than just me. In my last portfolio review, I swiped the portfolio to the left, and then 186 people in the community voted. 70% agreed with me that they did not like it, so I aligned to the majority of viewers' opinion. And as I said last time, I'm just some random dude on the internet who's passionate about dividend investing, but that doesn't mean that you need to agree with me. Just because I might like or dislike a company or a portfolio does not mean it's a good or bad company for you to own, or a good or bad portfolio. It's just my perspective of what I like, and I obviously don't know every detail about your finances and goals and risk tolerances and such, so just take this as entertainment. Okay, let's jump into it. I'll use websites like Seeking Alpha and Dividend.com for most of the stock info you see. Here's the email I got from a subscriber. He said, Hello, my name is Wells. I believe I sent you my portfolio to review a while back on Discord. Here's the updated portfolio. Age 18. Currently I am investing $400 a month into this portfolio. That is a bit steep for a broke college student, but haha. -ha. My thought process is that I'm racking up around 40 to 60 k in student loans over the course of getting my degree. He also said that he's not getting any help from his parents. They have a high household income, so no assistance paying for loans aside from offsetting costs at a community college for two years. He said his goal is to invest a heavy portion of his income into his portfolio over the next 15 to 20 years in order to generate a sustainable income. Then he said, in the portfolio, I have my allocation set to 70% individual stocks, 30% ETFs. I plan to shift this closer to maybe 65-35. My only issue is I'm on the fence about whether I should dedicate my ETF folder to just VU and SPHD or diversify it. Aside from that, just looking for a portfolio review based on my age, investment horizon, and goals. Thanks Wells. I think it's awesome that you are only 18 and investing. I didn't start off until I was 21, so you were already starting off great and way ahead of where I was. If you feel that you're investing a bit too much, then I don't think it's bad to step off the accelerator a bit so you feel more comfortable. Think of investing as a lifestyle, as a marathon that never ends. So you want to be investing at a pace that feels sustainable over decades. It's okay if sometimes you invest more, or less, or even none at all in bad times. Just don't burn yourself out or overinvest relative to what you're able to afford. That being said, pretty much every investor wishes they had started sooner and invested more, so keep that in mind. Wells sent me a link to his portfolio in M1, so I'll include that in the description below if you want to see it. I don't know when you started your portfolio, but it looks like the max M1 will go to is October of 2018, probably because one of your holdings only goes back that far. So I'll just assume you started then, which means you've gotten a total return of about 14.5%, which is great. Let's see how VU and SPY, which are basically the same thing, have done over that same time frame we see that their total return is about 3% over that time frame, which is about a 2% annualized return. This recent crash we experienced have significantly lowered the overall returns. I didn't choose to reinvest the dividends in this total returns calculator I use from Dividend Channel, because M1 estimates don't do that apparently. So your 14.5% return means that had you started your portfolio in October of 2018, you would have been significantly beating the market. So awesome job. Of course, we don't get too excited because it's a short time frame, but still I think you're doing great. We see you have 68 holdings, which is a bit high for my liking. I talked about this in my last Tinder video, but I think much beyond 30 holdings becomes too much for me personally to manage. You have enough positions where I'd ask you why not just simplify and have a single ETF. 
That being said, you've kind of created your own personalized ETF without many companies, and I can appreciate that it's more fun to hold single stocks. Looks like your portfolio's weighted average yield is 3.5%, so that sounds nice and conservative, which tells me that you're not going after a bunch of speculative stuff, a mistake that many other newer investors fall into. So, good job. Your expense ratio is nice and low at 0.05%. You've broken things into two main slices, an ETF slice, which is over 30% of your portfolio, and a dividend slice, which is 70%. Let's take a look at your ETF slice. Okay, you are holding VU at 50% and SPHD at 50%. Invesco's SPHD fund is a fund which pays out monthly. It's composed of S&P 500 stocks that deliver the highest dividends with the least volatility. It has a higher expense ratio at 0.3 as compared to VU, which is only at 0.03. So why does SPHD charge more? Well, they're managed funds, so they're identifying and keeping the highest dividend companies in the S&P 500 with the lowest volatility. They also gather all the dividends which come in quarterly or monthly or whenever, and then portion it out so you're paid monthly. So that's a nice perk if you want monthly income. I always tell people to just focus on quality companies and not look at what months the company pays out. It doesn't matter because as long as you get the cash, you can portion out your quarterly dividends so that you're paid monthly or bi-weekly or whenever you want, just like the people who are managing SPHD do. This is an important concept, so let's do an example to make sure I've explained it clearly. Let's use my friend Pierre's favorite stock, Johnson & Johnson. J&J pays out quarterly, as we see checking Street Insider. I'll include the link to Street Insider in my description in case you want to check other stocks on it. J&J is paying out $1.01 per share per quarter. So let's say you have 100 shares of J&J. That means J&J would be paying you $101 per quarter and they're paying out March, June, September, and December. Now let's pretend you wanted to be paid monthly rather than paid $101 every quarter. Well, all you need to do is split your 101 into three, which is about $33 per month, and voila, you're now getting paid monthly by J&J. Or if you wanna get paid weekly, you would split the $101 into 12, which means you'd be getting about $8 per week. So always, always, always invest in quality and then just budget your payouts to whatever time frame you want it, whether that's monthly or weekly or whatever. Okay, let's take a look at SPHD's top holdings. We see that most are names you probably recognize. For example, Altria is at 3% of the ETF, Dominion Energy is at 2.68%, etc. One company that isn't as well known is Williams Companies, which is a Fortune 500 energy company. Now let's take a look at SPHD's sector allocations. We see that real estate is its number one holding at 18.5% of it, and then utilities at 15.5, and consumer defensive at 14.2. Now let's dive into your dividend slice. I haven't really looked at the slice yet, other than to make sure there are some positions in there, so this will be my raw reaction to your single stocks. So we see you have 12 slices, and you have technology at 16%, Consumer Staples Household Products at 13%, Industrials at 12%, Consumer Staples Food Beverage at 12%, Utilities 10%, Healthcare 10%, Consumer Discretionary 9%, Real Estate 5%, Energy 5%, Communication Services 4%, Financial Services 3%, and Basic Materials 1%. So all that looks good. Let's go through these technology, seven positions, Microsoft, Apple, big two large positions, that's great. Shopify, it's been on a tear. I don't think they pay a dividend. So that's good, you actually do have some growth. Accenture, good consulting company. IBM, solid, Broadcom, Semi, and Intel Semi, both good semis. So those all look great. And let's look in the consumer staples household products. For companies, great names, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, Colgate, Palmolive, Clorox, even spread, looks good. Industrials, we've got 3M, solid, waste management, great. UPS, eh, not so hot on UPS, but they're okay. Legend Platt, General Dynamics, Caterpillar, weighted with 3M, waste management. So overall looks good. Consumer Staples Food Beverage, we've got Pepsi, Coke, Altria, Hormel, Kellogg's, General Mills, the heavy weighting on Pepsi and Coke, again that looks good to me. Utilities, we've got nine companies, Duke, Con Ed, a company you stone, Southern, 
Xterra, Emerson, Essential Utilities, DTE, American Water, PPL. So all those look good to me. I'm not as familiar with these two, but the rest of them seem good. And I'm sure those are fine as well. Healthcare, Johnson & Johnson, great. Pfizer, AbbVie, Merck, and Medtronic, and you're over waiting on Johnson & Johnson, which makes sense, good move. And then let's look at consumer discretionary. We've got five, McDonald's at 30%. Walmart 25%, Starbucks, Home Depot, Texas Roadhouse. I like all these. Don't know too much about Texas Roadhouse, but it's such a minor holding. Doesn't matter too much. And then if we go into real estate, realty income, great, 50%. Well Tower, Gladstone Store, MAA, Mid American Apartment Communities, Boston Properties, Innovative Industrial Properties. So some of these reads I'm not too keen on. Again, it's not going to matter too much because the overall weighting is minimal. I don't know if, for example, Mid-American, I don't think that passes my kind of 10-year consecutive dividends. I know well cut, um, but I'm not going to blame them too much for the pandemic. And then we come into energy and we have Chevron and Exxon, so those are solid. Obviously, energy is in a tough spot right now. Communication services, AT&T, good, Disney, Comcast, Verizon, so that's all good, and weighing it with AT&T, which is good, a little bit of risk. I really like how they, how Singer has gotten in there and they're pushing AT&T to drive down that debt, which looks like they're able to do so far. Financial services, 10, Visa, Solid, Travelers, MasterCard, JP Morgan's great, Goldman Sachs, Aflac, Wells Fargo, Blackstone Group, Bank of America, American Express. So all those are nice and solid. And basic materials, we have Lindy, which is a living chemicals company, so they're solid. Great. Overall looks good. I don't think you need both SPHD and VU, but it's not necessarily bad to do so, as they each have their own unique flavor that they bring to your portfolio. There's just some overlap, but most of the overlap is in good stock, so no biggie. You could also recreate SPHD and M1 so you would have no expense ratio, but that might be a pain to stay on top of it. I think you have a lot of stocks, and I personally start getting a bit itchy over 30, as it's hard for me to stay on top of them, but again, not a big deal. If we look at the sizes of your positions, I like that no one company overpowers your portfolio by having too much in it relative to others. Your sector weightings also seem good. So I like your portfolio overall, and I'm swiping right. Wells said he was planning on increasing his ETF pie by 5%, which seems reasonable to me. He asked if he should diversify his ETF slice, and I don't think you need to do it as I doubt it would materially change things, but go for it if that seems like the right move to you. The one thing you might consider doing is to invest in some growth stocks. Like if my kids were asking me, I'd tell them that companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, etc. are all strong companies to consider, especially at your age. Regardless, if you keep investing for 40 years, it wouldn't surprise me if you end at one or two million dollars. Obviously, I don't know if you'll get that high. But if the broad trends continue and you consistently invest a good amount in quality companies, there's no reason why you can't get there and beyond. You literally could become the person who starts a new legacy of investors in your family line, and someday your great, great, great grandkids might talk about the man who started it all for them. So what do all you out on the interweb think? Vote on my YouTube channel's community tab if you would swipe right and date this portfolio, or if you would swipe left and pass. Okay, now I want to tell you about the world's first public company which also happened to have a dividend. And then I'll tell you about a stock that very few people are talking about that has blown away the S&P 500 index out of the water for the last 20 years and has been paying dividends for over 200 consecutive years, which is the most in the world. Let's start with the world's first public company, which was the Dutch East India Company, which is also called VOC after its Dutch name. VOC was a mega corporation founded by several Dutch trading companies in 1602. That's right, over 400 years ago. They were the first multinational corporation to operate in different continents, including Europe, Asia, and Africa. They bought and sold products from around the world, including Indian spices, African wine, and Indonesian coffee. Hmm, I could go for a nice Indonesian coffee right now. They were a corporate pioneer that had foreign investors. They sold shares of their companies to the public, becoming the first public company, and they were the first public company to ever pay dividends. They had over 150 ships, over 50,000 employees around the world, had their own army of 10,000 soldiers, and they provided a dividend payment of 40% on your original investment. 
I found this info on Wikipedia that said that VOC also started the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, which became the world's first working stock exchange, which is where they IPO'd. The Amsterdam Stock Exchange is recognized as the origin of modern stock exchanges. So those Dutch folks were innovative financial gurus. In fact, they were the ones that created concepts like stock options, futures, short selling, and other stock market terms you're probably familiar with. VOC stayed in existence until around 1800 when they went out of business. But there is a company that has paid dividends for over 200 consecutive years, and it's one that not too many people talk about. It's the York Water Company, ticker Y-O-R-W, which is a utility company that operates in Pennsylvania. It was founded in 1816 and has the longest record of consecutive dividends of any company ever at 204 years. How is that possible? Well, water has been a staple that people have always needed. Water and beer. Seeking Alpha says that they have 23 consecutive years of dividend growth. Wow. They have a five-year CAGR, which is fairly low at 3.88%, a great payout ratio of 59%, and a starting yield today of 1.68%. Now what is really amazing are their total returns with dividends reinvested. They have blown SPY out of the water, so to speak. If you'd invested $10,000 in 1999 in York Water, you would have had an average annual return of 12.7% compared to about 5.6% for SPY. That means your 10K in York Water would have turned into 123K versus 31K for SPY. That's crazy. That's better returns than you would have gotten with Microsoft. Microsoft had 9.8% annualized returns for the last 20 years as compared to York Water's 12.7%, which means you would have ended at about 72k for Microsoft as compared to 123k for York Water. Are you kidding me? For Wawa? Now I haven't done a deep analysis into them, but I thought those initial stats looked pretty compelling and might warrant digging deeper. Okay, finally I'd like to thank a couple new Patreon champions. So first thank you goes to Cloud Ninja. As his name implies, he has a great job working on cloud services, specifically Amazon. It was great talking to Cloud on Discord. I also want to say thank you to Ryan of All Trades. He's a neat guy with a variety of interests including investing, cars, and martial arts. In fact, he's studying Wing Chun, which is a Chinese Kung Fu style of self-defense that requires quick arm movements and strong legs in a relaxed manner. Ryan's martial arts teacher is Rob Hannon, who trained under Grandmaster Benny Meng, who trained under Mo Yat, who trained under the legendary Chinese martial artist Ip Man, aka Yip Man. Yip Man was Bruce Lee's trainer. It's been super fun chatting with both you guys on Discord. I run the world's largest free dividend Discord chat server, and the last time I checked we had over 2700 dividend investors on it, and it's growing all the time. And a sincere thank you if you watch all the way to the end. These videos take a lot of time and energy for me to create, so liking my video is a simple way you can thank me. Please subscribe if you haven't yet, and consider checking out my Patreon page or my affiliate links in the description of this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll chat with you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.